You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Welcome to episode 73 of the GDPR Weekly Show. And as always, I'd like to start with a shout out to our new listeners. And this week we have new listeners in London, Birmingham, Portsmouth, Cardiff, Guildford, Southampton, Leicester, Ipswich, Reading, Chelmsford, Northampton, Norwich, Cambridge, Wakefield, Dudley, Leeds, Doncaster, Manchester, Twickenham, Glasgow, Swansea, St. Bees, Aston under Lyne, Fodgsham, Nottingham, Inchinan, Wrexham, Chichester, Coventry and Eastleigh, all in the UK. New listeners in Dublin, County Wicklow and County Clare in Ireland. New listeners in Paris, in France, Barcelona in Spain, Lisbon in Portugal. New listeners in Luxembourg. New listeners in Brussels in Belgium. In Amsterdam, Eindhoven and Tilburg in the Netherlands. In Frankfurt, Dusseldorf, Cologne and Essen, all in Germany. New listeners too in Kolding and Copenhagen in Denmark. New listeners in Oslo in Norway, Stein in Sweden, Tampere in Finland, Moscow in Russia, Tallinn in Estonia, Kiev in Ukraine, Katowice and Warsaw in Poland, Freiburg, Bern and Geneva in Switzerland, Venice in Italy, Ljubljana in Slovenia, Amman in Jordan, Nairobi in Kenya, Johannesburg in South Africa, Karnataka in India, Bangkok in Thailand, Tokyo in Japan, Adelaide, Sydney and Melbourne, all in Australia, Wellington in New Zealand, Sao Paulo in Brazil, Santander in Colombia, Vancouver, Toronto and Montreal in Canada, and then in the USA this week, we have new listeners from San Francisco, Yakima, Boston, Dallas, Los Angeles, Fort Worth, Seattle, Atlanta, New York, Mason City, Oklahoma City, Washington DC, Rochester, Denver, Raleigh, Philadelphia, Fort Myers, Minneapolis, Austin, Naples, San Diego, Orlando, Greensboro and Lafayette. So wherever you are in the world, it's great to have you along as new listeners and of course a big shout out to all of our regular listeners in tune in every week. And it's great for all of you and I really appreciate you all taking 30 minutes or so out of your week to catch up on the latest news in the world of GDPR. And as always, hope you find the programme useful and informative. And if you have any feedback for me at all, then please just send an email to podcast at insurety, that's E-N-S-U-R-E-T-Y dot co dot U-K and... I look forward to receiving your feedback. I do read every single email that comes in. Unfortunately, I don't have time to respond to them all individually. But any ideas that you have for improvements to the show, then I look to incorporate those. And equally, if you have any ideas on anyone you'd like to see interviewed on the show, or maybe you'd like me to interview you on the show, then please just let me know in an email to podcast at insurability.co.uk and do anything possible to incorporate your suggestions into the programme. So, in just a few moments, I'll be telling you what's coming up in this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Check us out on Facebook. So, coming up in this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show, we have an update on the virus infection and ongoing malware and potential data breach at Currency Exchange Specialist TrebleX. We have news of a data breach at app game producer Zynga. We have news of Ditson Carphone being fined half a million pounds under the Data Protection Act for a data breach which predated the introduction of GDPR. We have news that the Indian PDPA takes its next step towards implementation. Now that it looks like Brexit is certainly going ahead, what does that mean for GDPR? We have a look at that. We take a look at a potential for a data breach which lots of companies probably don't pay enough attention to, which is what's happening to their end-of-life equipment and how it's disposed of. And then finally this week we have an update on the long-running legal battle over the Irish Public Services card and data privacy concerns around the use of that card. So as always, a mixed bag of articles for you. Hope you find the programme useful and entertaining. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. If you listened to last week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show, you have heard us mention 
a potential data breach which was occurring at foreign currency exchange service Travelex. Travelex took their website offline on New Year's Eve and it's still offline now as we speak on the 12th of January 2020 so that's at least 12 days now that the website has been out of use and on their website Travelex have a very simple message which says we're sorry but our online travel money service isn't available right now this is a result of a software virus on discovering the virus and as a precautionary measure Travelex immediately took all its systems offline to prevent the spread of the virus further across their network Whilst the investigation is still ongoing, to date our investigation shows that customer data has not been compromised. We have now contained the virus and are working to restore our systems and resume normal operations as quickly as possible. Travelex's network of branches continue to provide foreign exchange services manually and a number of workarounds are provided below. We apologise to our customers for any inconvenience caused as a result. Travelex is in discussions with the National Crime Agency and the Metropolitan Police who are conducting their own criminal investigations. They then offer the options for people who still wish to get foreign currency via Travelex to visit one of their stores and they say that their travel money stores are open seven days a week and to find your nearest store you can contact Travelex customer service team on 0345 872 7627. But the problem over the course of the last week has spread wider than Travelex because Travelex provide currency services to a number of other banks and as a result of the disruption at Travelex it's caused problems for people wishing to exchange currency at Lloyds, Barclays and the Royal Bank of Scotland together with supermarkets Sainsbury's and Tesco's. Now, when we've spoken to Travelex towards the end of the last week, they said they're still confident that there is no evidence that com- customer data has been compromised. And this is a story which they are maintaining with the ICO as well. And the ICO say there's been no data breach reported to them yet, although the ICO are understood to be working with Travelex to minimise the extent of the problem. However, there are also press reports in the UK that Travelex is in negotiations to to pay the people who put the virus onto Travelex's system, put the ransomware onto their system, a bribe of up to $6 million. Now, Travelex have not officially confirmed that those negotiations are underway, perhaps somewhat unsurprisingly, but it would seem to suggest that there must be some data in question there, because otherwise why would Travelex be offering to pay a ransom? At the Travelex offices, although it's possible to still exchange money, because their computer system is down, then cashiers have been resorting to pen and paper to actually perform the currency conversions. And the problem for the bank is that obviously they can't work that way and also they're saying that their supply of foreign currency via Travelex has dried up. And it's important to stress this not just in the UK and Europe, right around the world, Travelex systems are currently down and not operating. Now you might think, well, why would you want to pay a ransom in the first place? Well, there is perhaps a precedent for this in that steel producer North Hydro was hit by the Locker Joga ransomware last March. And in their case, some 170 factories and offices were taken offline and their manufacturing was partially suspended. And it's noticeable there that the the hackers had were understood to demand a ransom of £300,000. The company refused to pay, but instead have spent probably around £50 million recovering their operations. We know that in Travelex's case, the ICO is actively speaking with Travelex, even though no data breach has yet formally been reported, and doubtless this story will continue to run into the coming week. So we will look to provide you with another update on this story in next week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Zynga, a successful mobile game company with titles like Farmville, Mafia Wars and Cafe World, has become the target of a data breach. A Pakistani hacker who goes by the online alias of Gnostic players took responsibility for the attack 
claiming he had managed to breach words with friends and draw something to the games produced by Zynga to access the data of more than 200 million users. The same person made headlines previously for selling nearly a billion stolen records from 45 online services. It is understood that the attack affected all people who installed and signed up for Words with Friends on or before September 2nd, 2019. The stolen data includes names, emails, phone numbers, Facebook IDs and more. The hacker also exposed the passwords for more than 7 million users of Draw Something. Zynga, in a published statement, admitted to the data breach, saying account information may have been illegally accessed. Fortunately, the attack contained no financial data. The company didn't unveil the number of users affected, nor which countries had been affected, i.e. which countries the users lived in. However, it identified account login information that hackers may have accessed. Going forward, Zynga says that it will protect accounts from invalid logins. The company will also contact impacted users following an investigation with law enforcement and third-party forensic. In some cases, the brand's apps may require users to change their passwords upon logging in. According to the company, they accept that cyber attacks are a reality of modern business. However, it plans to reaffirm the commitment to the security of player data and to its player community. If we receive any future update from Zynga, on this data breach, we will of course bring it to you in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Dixon's car phone warehouse have been fined £500,000 for a massive data breach which occurred just before GDPR came into force which in a way was probably good news for Dixon's car phone, or they could have found themselves with a far higher fine as the £500,000 they have now been fined was the maximum allowed under the old Data Protection Act, whereas of course under GDPR they could have been fined 4% of their turnover. The cyber attack affected at least 14 million people. The retailer discovered the massive data breach last summer, and indeed you may remember that we brought you news of that in the GDPR Weekly Show at the time, and a subsequent investigation by the Information Commissioner's Office found that the attacker had installed malicious software on 5,390 tills in branches of Curry's PC World and the Dixon's Travel chain, Dixon's Travel being the um, Dixon's branches which are in major ports and airports. The road software went undetected over a nine-month period between July 2017 and April 2018, hence why it's before GDPR, and collected a huge amount of data, leaving customers vulnerable to both financial theft and identity fraud. Steve Eckersley, the ICO's Director of Investigation, said the ICO had found systemic failures in the way Dixon's car phone looked after customer data. Such careless loss of data is likely to have caused distress to many people since the data breach left them exposed to an increased risk of fraud, he said. The attacker harvested the payment card details of some 5.6 million people, as well as the personal information, including full names, postcodes, email addresses and details of failed credit checks, of approximately 14 million people. The ICO said that Dixon's car phone's poor security arrangements and the inadequate steps taken to protect data had breached the Data Protection Act 1998. It's worth pointing out that last year the ICO fined car phone warehouse part of the same group £400,000 for similar security vulnerabilities. So if you put those two together, of course it now means that Dixon's car phone as a group has been found, have been fined uh, close on £900,000 for data breaches. The fine is maximum penalty allowed under the old Data Protection Act. Alex Bulldock, the group chief executive of Dixon's car phone, said the company disputed some of the ICS findings and was considering its grounds for appeal. The company had, he said, made significant investment in its information security systems and processes. There was, he added, no confirmed evidence of any customers suffering fraud or financial loss as a result. He went on to say, we are very sorry for any inconvenience this historic incident caused to our customers. When we found the unauthorised access to data, we promptly launched an investigation, added extra security measures and contained the incident. We duly notified regulators and the police and communicated with all of our customers. So we don't yet know whether Dixon's car phone will appeal in this case, but if they do, we will of course bring you all the details of that appeal in future episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. 
India's answer to GDPR has achieved quite a feat this week. It's drawn the anger of both big tech companies and privacy advocates at the same time. A session draft of the Personal Data Protection Act, which will be known under the acronym of PDPA, approved by Narendra Modi's government on December 4th, has retained data localization provisions that critics feel overzealously protect personal data. In this latest version, PDPA, which will govern how personal information is gathered and handled by business and government bodies within India, highlights in particular how technology companies must manage the data of Indian citizens. The bill, while requiring sensitive data to remain on servers within India's territory, at the same time permits non-sensitive data to be, to be stored outside of India. The scope of sensitive or critical data, that which is to be stored locally, is to be defined by the Indian government. Trade groups, including the US-India Business Council and the US-India Strategic Partnership Forum, have balked at such barriers to operating in a country of some 200 million internet users and an IT sector with an annual growth rate of 7.2%. Both industry bodies have argued that complying with such measures would be too expensive and expressed concerns about the potential impact on India's growing digital economy. AJ Pal Banga, the president and CEO of Mastercard, another major operator in India, has been one to voice criticism to the data localization efforts of the Indian government in an investor call last November. Bloomberg reports Banga as saying... When we talk about our lack of support for data localization, it's not caused so much by expense. It's caused by the inefficiency of what that does to the ability to provide safety, security and analytics to India's banks and merchants. But government officials in India have reportedly cited the Pegasus breach in which hackers installed spyware on phones via WhatsApp as exemplifying the need for data localization rules in the name of consumer privacy. The other difference is that electronic data protection in India is currently governed by the Indian Penal Code, the Information Technology Act 2000 and the Information Technology Rules, which were first introduced in 2011. The PDPA emerged from a Supreme Court ruling in 2017 that found privacy to be a fundamental right and the new changes replaced an initial draft produced in 2018. Justice Sri Krishna, architect of the bill's first draft, told the Data Protection Authority that the PDPA is dominated by government. The bill allows government agencies to obtain access to user data from companies under national security grounds. He also observed that an attempt by the government in the PDPA's second draft to control social media by reserving the right of access without consent of non-personal data or anonymised data, justified by the government on the basis of improving policy making and public services. According to Prashant Mali, president of Mumbai-based Cyber Law Consulting, India is starting from scratch culturally as well as legislatively when it comes to data protection, currently boasting one of the laxest data protection regimes among the world's major economies. And of course it's that which makes the EU nervous of people who and organisations who are using outsourcing in India unless further steps are taken by those individual organisations to prove how compliant the processes they're using in India are with data. It's worth pointing out that the PDPA will be introducing us into a society where privacy is less prized than it is in Europe. Despite warnings of government mission creep, PDPA aims to provide consumers with new privacy rights pertaining to data collection, which require a user to consent to their information being collected and shared. The data protection legislation is, has a very similar framework to GDPR, with the same principle of financial penalties being issued for companies who are non-compliant. In the case of PDPA, it's proposed that the fine would be 2% of a company's global annual turnover, with a penalty being able to reach 4% if a major violation occurs. But it's worth noting that there is another significant difference between GDPR and PDPA. GDPR is a civil remedy to a civil harm, whereas PDPA also entails criminal liabilities and potential jail time for company directors who breach the regulations. 
PDPA is expected to become law in India sometime in 2020 and we will of course keep you updated with developments in upcoming editions of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host Keith Budden. With Brexit having passed its final stage in the House of Commons this week and now gone to the House of Lords, it's looking incredibly likely that the UK will indeed be leaving the European Union on the 31st of January 2020. And so it's worth us looking a little, perhaps, at what that might mean in terms of GDPR. Well, the first is, is that for most companies and organisations and members of the public, they're not going to notice much difference because GDPR will become UK GDPR and that basically will encompass the rules within the Data Protection Act 2018. But a lot then depends on whether we are able to achieve a negotiated settlement with trade with the EU before the 31st of December 2020, which the UK government says is perfectly feasible, but the EU seems to be distinctly cooler on. So what if we don't make that on the 31st of December? What happens then? Well, as I say, for domestic purposes, very little will change. GDPR will become known as UK GDPR, but other than that, most people won't notice any difference. But in terms of trade with the European Union, and particularly data transfer to the European Union, the UK will become what is known as a third country. And for the purposes of GDPR, third country is one outside of the EU, and Iceland, Norway and Liechtenstein. Now, being a third country doesn't mean that you can't exchange data with the EU. It does mean that you have to make use of the standard contractual clauses, though, as some of you may be aware of if you're already dealing with data flows outside of the EU to uh, India, for example, as we mentioned in the previous article, or to the US or Canada, then you'll be familiar already with the standard contractual clauses which have to be included to satisfy GDPR. But ultimately, what you want is for the EU to make what's called an adequacy decision, which says basically that they accept that your standards of data uh, protection are the same as those required under GDPR or better. And as we put this article together at the moment, then there are currently adequacy decisions in place with Andorra, Argentina, Guernsey, the Isle of Man, Israel, Jersey, New Zealand, Switzerland and Uruguay and partial arrangements in place with Japan, Canada and the USA. USA particularly under the EU-US Privacy Shield. If Brexit is completed on the terms of the current draft of withdrawal agreement, UK GDPR will be deemed adequate by the EU and data flows from the EU to the UK will not require any additional safeguards than it does today. In addition, the UK government has confirmed that, that as part of the introduction of the UK GDPR, it will recognise the adequacy decisions of the EU and GDPR itself as adequate for the purposes of UK data flowing to those countries, and as such, no further safeguards are needed for data flowing out of the UK either. So to summarise, in a deal scenario, data flowing in either direction is protected and no further action is required. In a no-deal scenario, the UK government will still recognise the adequacy decision of the EU and EU GDPR as adequate for data flowing from the UK. The difference is with data coming into the UK, which, as we say, would require the standard contractual clauses as things stand at this moment in time. The only other consideration, though, once we leave the EU, and this will apply whether we leave with a deal at the end of this year or not, is that UK-based businesses who are actually doing business with people in the EU need to consider whether they need to appoint a European representative because at the moment you don't need a European representative if you're a company in the UK because we are part of Europe. But by the end of the year, without an agreement, we won't be. And so there will be a need then for UK-based businesses to appoint a European representative That's something we're taking very seriously here at Insurity. And if you're in that situation where you're a UK-based business but you have customers in 
Europe and you want to talk about appointing a European representative, then please do get in touch with us. Drop us an email to podcast at insurability.co.uk and one of our specialists will guide you through the next steps to appointing a European representative. This whole matter of how things are going to perform after the end of 2020 is of course likely to um, flow during 2020 and there will be no doubt steps forward and steps backwards but we will of course keep you abreast of any changes in future episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host Keith Budden. With the start of the new year and indeed the new decade, it's like that many organisations are thinking about upgrading their IT systems, replacing redundant systems and particularly replacing ageing hardware. But it's in the replacement of ageing hardware that a real risk occurs under GDPR and particularly the risk of a data breach. Because organisations that claim to be compliant with GDPR, CCPA and other regulations should take a close look at data on devices which they are disposing of. Research by Blanco Technology Group in August 2019 observed that nearly 73% of surveyed people thought that end-of-life devices were a potential security risk but actually were doing very little about it. The current misconception of decision makers when selecting inadequate data sanitization methods have put companies at risk of a breach. The research also found that self-assured attitude of organisations is leaving organisations vulnerable to attack. Blanco Technology Group surveyed 1,850 senior leaders representing the world's largest enterprises in Europe, the Pacific and North America. The study explicitly highlighted an incident where Blanco purchased 159 hard drives via eBay in countries like the US, the UK, Finland and Germany. These sellers ensured the cleanliness of data from the devices. But unfortunately, that was not the case. Nearly 42% of the devices still contained data, of which 15% was personal information or corporate data. The data retrieved included 5 gigabytes of archived office email with a leading travel company, 3 gigabytes of data belonging to a cargo or freight company with shipping details, schedules and registrations, scanned copies of family passports and birth certificates belonging to a software developer, and CVs and financial records with a high level of government security clearance. The inefficient methods of data removal are serving as a loophole for data security, the study found. Commonly, data was removed using free tools, methods like formatting, overwriting, etc., but these weren't being effective at removing all of the data. When asked why they didn't take more care of disposing of the data, the most common factor was the time involved rather than the cost with some companies claiming that it took almost two weeks to remove all the data and ensure the sanitisation of the devices. So what is the recommended way of dealing with sanitising data for a device? First is to have an audit trail with standard practice to verify the assets before disposal. Review the current processes and policies to be followed. The policies on a robust IT asset disposal process should be implemented vigorously without any loopholes. And making sure that you have a clear chain of actual physical proof of where the, da- where the data is gone and also where the actual hard drive itself is gone. It's probably not a good idea if you're an organisation or company to actually put your devices for sale on eBay. But equally, it's probably a good idea to make sure that you have it within your contract that any subcontractor you use to dispose of your, day, of your equipment doesn't put the equipment on eBay either. So if you are renewing your equipment this year, as many of you probably will be, then do make sure you pay attention to scrubbing the data from the devices before you dispose of them. Or alternatively, of course, actually physically destroy the devices rather than just allowing them to go as full devices to some third party for disposal. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Over in the Republic of Ireland, evidence continues to mount that the beleaguered and ill-considered public services card is the wannabe cross-departmental project that's become too big and too costly to fail. And for that, it's feared that Irish taxpayers will end up paying. With its decision last week to legally challenge the Data Protection Commission's formal enforcement notice, 
which was issued in December after the department failed to comply with the regulator's damning August report on the child project. The Department for Social Protection signalled it has entered a do-or-die legal long haul over the public services charge. The Department of Social Protection, from which the charge emanated, informed the Government's Public Accounts Committee last year that the charge project had cost some €68 million Euros by that point. But the DPC's long-awaited report found the charge non-compliant with data protection and privacy considerations on seven of eight points the Department had put forward in its defence during an investigation that had originally begun back in 2017. The report stated there was no legal basis for departments other than social protection to mandate service users to register for the card. The card had at various points been mandatory for people looking to avail themselves of a range of services through other government departments, including taking the written driving test, applying for citizenship or obtaining their first passport. The report outlined obvious and significant deficits in terms of logic and consistency for when the charge was required. It also found a serious lack of transparency and required changes in how the whole project was being run. But it did allow the continued use of the charge for services within social protection. Notably, other departments beyond the charge's two most ardent advocates, social protection and public expenditure and reform, had quietly abandoned use of the card in line with the DPC's findings. It's worth noting that Social Protection has not challenged the factual basis for the findings in the report, but only the enforcement notice that followed months later. Willfully or not, the Department failed to bring a judicial appeal to dispute the report's findings within the required three-month deadline. For its part, the DPC decided not to issue an enforcement notice until after the judicial period ran out in November. Certainly, the Department will have zero moral authority if it is the case that it recognised internally that it could not object to the DPC's factual findings of problems with the charge and its use in ways to violate the data protection rights of Irish citizens, but wages it might get away with a legal loophole to keep the PSC, the charge, in operation. The potential loophole is that the DPC's investigation began after GDPR was enacted in May 2018, so a decision based on GDPR could not be enforced retrospectively for this particular investigation. The Department may also have calculated that it was safe for appealing the enforcement order in the Circuit Court, where any decisions can only be appealed to the High Court. A a judicial review could have been appealed to the Supreme Court, presided over by Chief Justice Frank Clark, who has shown expansive interest and knowledge in privacy-related cases in the past. Either way, by taking the decision that it did, for a legal process that will rumble on for months, the Department of Social Protection, as well as running up a large taxpayer bill, almost certainly kicked the entire card issue into the long grass, where it will sit festering until after the upcoming general election in the Republic of Ireland. If the courts ultimately side with the Department purely on the basis of a legal loophole, rather than concrete finding of facts, we can all look forward to the cynicism of the government ministers who made the determination, contravening and ignoring the actual rights and protections that its own citizens are now afforded under European law. Undercutting the DPC in its most significant domestic decision to date would also be an international own goal for the Irish government as it argues that the DPC provides a robust, balanced and respected regulatory regime for multinational companies. Ultimately, regardless of the appeal, If the child is a clear violation of data protection law, as so many Irish and international data protection experts have long argued, future Irish governments will be open to all legal challenges of any citizen issued with the child might care to bring under the protection of GDPR and the payment of any consequent damages. This is likely to run and run, certainly for the rest of this year and maybe even into next, and so we will keep you updated in future episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. So that brings us to the end of this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it entertaining. Please do let me know. Let me have your feedback by sending an email to podcast.insurity.co.uk. You can find out more about us and Insurity at www.insurity.co.uk. And I look forward to speaking to you again, same time, same place, next week. Have a good week, everybody, and remember to keep your data safe. Check us out on Facebook.
The GDPR Weekly Show is an insurability production. Follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash insurity.